Without further ado, it is my great pleasure to welcome, please give him a warm applause, Christopher Castellani. Here he is. Hi, Christopher. How are you? Actually, I can see your picture right there. Oh, there he is your life. <laughs> Hi, Ian. Thank you so much for that introduction. Um, and thank you to Christine and to Raising a Reader um, for inviting me here today. I'm so excited to speak with my my friend, Marianne Leone, it's so great to have a friend of whom you are also a fan. Um, so that's, that's sort of where I am right now. Um, and um, so um, I would love to tell you more about Marianne. Do we want to bring her on? Uh, yeah, I'll say goodbye. She can come okay. and you can talk. Okay, we'll all be right here watching. Excellent. <laughs> um, great. So um, I, first, I first met Marianne um, there you are. I was wondering when you would appear. <laughs> um, so I, you know, um, I first met Marianne through Grub Street, which is the organization that Ian, Ian mentioned that I've been involved with, a writing organization. Um, and I met her because, um, I met you, I should speak directly to you, right? I think that, that would, <laughs> it's not fun to be talked about in the third person, right? Um, although it's better than not being talked about at all. Right. Um, so, um, a while, so. Exactly. Yes. Um, so, so we first met through Grub Street when you were writing your, you know, your first memoir, but we're going to get to that later. Um, I want to talk first about, uh, about the fact that we're both first generation Italian Americans um, and we both grew up with, you know, very particular relationships to, um, to reading and to writing. Um, and so I want you to, um, if you could just talk a little bit about what it was like to grow up in your house, uh, building on the quote um, that you have. And, uh, but before that, I want to make sure that everyone in the audience knows that not only are you a writer and a reader, you're also an actress um, who has been on The Sopranos and in various films. Um, you are also you write op eds, you write screenplays, um, you're an activist, um, and you're just an all around. I think you know, um, I'm someone who um, who read your books described you as a force of nature, and I feel like that's a that's that, that's a really great description um, of you. So I wanted to make sure everyone knew about your background um, before you tell us a bit about what it was like to grow up first generation uh, with books. Well, thank you so mm. much for inviting me. Raising a Reader is a great organization and I fully believe in everything you do. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, Christine. Thank, thank you, Christopher, for agreeing to do this. this is nothing but fun. And happy Blooms Day to everybody. <laughs> this is my copy of Ulysses, <laughs> from the Jurassic Age held together with green tape that I'm now rereading. And I'm reading my, my childish Palmer method uh, notes in the margin, which is almost as, as great as rereading the book. But, um, so I am very happy to be here and talk about reading. So I don't know what your experience was. Mine was that, like I said, my mother considered it me a slacker for reading, but my father encouraged it and he was self-taught. He was reading Tolstoy and when he died, he had not one day of formal education, but the house was filled with books. And he was an immigrant as well, right? You're he was an immigrant. He came here at, at the age of 10. Mm -hmm. And uh, my mother came here at 18 to escape an arranged marriage and fascism, which mm -hmm. is kind of ironic. <clears throat> but at any rate, she... Um, <laughs> She not there quite yet. <laughs> not yet, maybe. Um, but at any rate, um, they there was a library at the end of my street. So once I went through the books that my father, my father made a book spot for me in my baby brother's room. He um, filled a closet with books and he told me, this is your place. This is for you. These books are all yours. And I somehow taught myself to read. I don't remember that. Did, do you remember learning to read? I I. I know. I mean, I vaguely remember the, you know, the, uh, like, you know, um, I mean, you mentioned the Palmer method handwriting. I, you know, you know, um, I vaguely remember practicing my writing, looking up above the chalkboard that had the, um, yes, the Palmer method letters and practicing that, but I don't remember actually learning to read. And I also don't remember where my even desire to read because my, you know, my parents, um, unlike yours, both of my parents um, didn't read. We had no books 
in our house. Um, and, and I don't remember where the actual desire to read came from. So I wonder for you, would you was, it, was it that you saw your father reading and you said, I want yes. to- Yes, and I, I adored him, of course. Okay. And yes, okay. and also- And you wanted to rebel against your mother, right? Of course, <laughs> you got it. Um, and also there was a library at the end of my street. So once I outgrew the baby books that my father had put there for me or went through them all, I could just walk up the street without even crossing a big street and go by myself, you know? And I, one of my earliest memories is of trying to take a book out of the library and Val Leone, no relation, but you know, everybody's from the same village in the part of Newton that I grew up in. <laughs> They're all from the same village in Italy. So there are many names that are similar. Right. <laughs> and um, she, I remember her saying to me, this is a fifth grade book and it's a chapter book and you're in the first grade and me saying, yeah, but I can read it and I'll prove it to you. And I did. <laughs> and um, the thing that warmed my, it literally choked me up to the point where I almost couldn't read was that she came to my, my reading of Jessie, oh, uh, wow. first book at Newtonville Books. Mm -hmm. There she was in her 90s, sitting in the front row. Fantastic. My librarian. Oh so, my gosh. And so, I mean, she, I'm sure she felt a sense of pride in the fact that she had helped you along yes. that journey, right? Yeah, I mean, yes. uh, that was probably, it was a big moment for you, but it was probably, you know, a pretty big moment for you know, for her as well. Um, I was an yeah. omnivore as far as reading. I read everything, backs wow. of cereal boxes, right. everything <laughs> when I was a kid. And I had no discrimination as far as what was, what was good or what was not, right. you know. Do you remember I read, like your favorite types of books though to read? Um, well, Gothic. Once I turned about 12, it was okay. all, you know, the Moors and uh, the Brontes <laughs> and uh, <laughs> doomed love. <laughs> and I mean, the Gothic was a big phase. Right. Then it turned to beat poetry and, uh, and all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> and did you like? Were you were you always writing, or 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 did your first impulse to write come from wanting to write a memoir about your son? No, I, I wrote. I always wrote. I, I wrote along with being an actor because, like, when I was a starving actor, my husband and I in New York, mm -hmm. um, one of the ways to get an agent was other out of work actors and ourselves, we put together a, a comedy group. And so I wrote sketch comedy. So it was easier to get an agent to come and uh, have a drink, you know, on Theater Row and watch an hour of comedy of than to see Macbeth on Avenue D, you mm -hmm. know? So um, it's how I got my first agent. It's how I got my first, uh, my union, my first union job was wow. from writing, was from writing sketch comedy. So, and we did the clubs and that was terrifying. <laughs> absolutely terrifying a new york club at midnight and did you do, so you would write the I, I don't know how any of this would work you would write you would you would actually write the sketches and then they would include would it include any improv or was it all really no kind of they were all scripted oh wow and that was bad when we had hecklers because you couldn't break the fourth wall <laughs> but, but it was a good training and i also became one of my day jobs as a temp i became a reader at mgm mm -hmm. so here I am reading and getting paid for it. I'm reading manuscripts, right? And, I, and screenplay. And it taught me how to write screenplay. That was my next I read, question. Yeah. I read so many screenplays mm -hmm. that I kind of started by osmosis to understand, okay, by page 10, it's got to be this. By page 20, it's got to be this. So right. structure, I learned structure from reading so many screenplays. I, I would have to report on them as if it were a book report, you right. know, and it was very, even though I'm unproduced, I've sold screenplays and I've, I've had my screenplays optioned and, uh, you know, hmm. it's... Um, that, you know, that's the thing about screenplays. I mean, um, that they do have to follow. It's they they are so regimented. They do have to follow this particular structure. So it's yes. not about reinventing the wheel. It's about making right. what's in that structure as I guess fresh and that's interesting right. and compelling as possible. And there's probably no better way to learn how to do it than reading probably a lot of bad screenplays. Oh, <laughs> that's what terrible. gave me the impetus to write. I thought this guy. <laughs> this guy's with William Morris. I could <laughs> write something better than this. Right. So yeah, so it was, it was that. Yeah. You think, um, so, so that's interesting because I know that I, you know, one of the reasons I wanted to write was because I also, as I mentioned, I, you know, I also fell in love with reading somehow. I don't remember how. And I remember very vividly wanting to write because I wanted, 
because I admired these books so much right. that I wanted to be on the shelf with them, right? I, I, I wanted to, not that I thought I actually had much to say, but, but I just, I thought like, I want that. I want to make something that affects people the way these books have affected me, you know? Um, that, that, what you, what you felt did not happen to me for a long time because I, that's the whole reason that I discovered Grub Street right. was even though I had made my, you know, I had actually, I stopped acting for 10 years um, when I was raising, you know, when Jesse was little because we couldn't both be away. My husband is an actor too. He was working all the time. Mm -hmm. So I started writing screenplay, but I had such respect for prose. Mm. I mean, uh, there was Colette over here and Joyce over here saying like, uh -huh. <laughs> so I was, when, when I went to write long form prose, I, I felt intimidated and that's how I ended up, that's how I ended up at Grub Street and right. it gave me, it really gave me um, the wherewithal to, to go ahead and write, you know, because screenplay is more collaborative. Screenplay, I mean, I sold a screenplay to HBO, the notes are uh, it's beyond belief, the notes yeah, that you I'm get. too selfish to be a screenwriter. Exactly. You know? Exactly. Uh, centered, maybe. Like, it must so, be so hard to collaborate. When Simon & Schuster bought Jesse, it was a warm bath. I couldn't believe it. I, I came back, I said to my husband, oh my God, I didn't have to dumb anything down. Right. They, <laughs> they got it, you know? And, uh, and they were so respectful as opposed to screenplay where they're like, oh, by the way, a third of your screenplay now takes place on Mars. Right. They're not going to do that right. to your exactly. novel, you know? So, and I should um, make clear for the, you know, for the audience that you're talking about your first memoir, Jesse, A Mother's Story, right. um, which you wrote about your son, Jesse, and you got, and you got started working on that at Grub Street. Now, what did you, what did you, like, what did you have when you started? Did you already, had you already sketched out some of it? Or? Well, what happened was it, 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 it springboarded off an essay that I wrote three months after my son died. And uh, it was a way to, you know, it was a way to, you know, I have files, files of pe parents of children with disabilities because Jesse was born prematurely. He had quadriplegia. He was nonverbal. <clears throat> and I have, I have files and files of parents who wrote me after reading the book. Mm -hmm. And they looked at, upon it as, you know, because I wrote about our struggle to get Jesse his basic civil rights to a free and appropriate uh, public education. And um, uh, but that's not why I wrote it. I wrote it selfishly to spend time with Jesse because I was so destroyed by losing him that uh, I just wanted to spend all this time with him. And that's, that's what was the impetus. But it started with the, um, it started with the uh, essay in the Globe. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So, it, so, it, so, okay, so, so, yeah, so you wrote it more as, uh, more as an advocacy kind of, the, the essay, more, more in terms of, advocacy or no. I didn't I didn't write it in terms of advocacy I just wrote about um I just wrote about him yeah yeah and, uh, the advocacy came later it was the only and the book was non-linear mm -hmm. it was a non-linear book mm -hmm. and I remember saying my agent saying to me well I'm going to send it out to 20 uh, publishers and if 18 of them come back and tell me it has to be linear right. then we'll talk but right. my muse was Abigail Thomas, who wrote this wonderful memoir called Three Dog Life, mm. where she also had a sense of humor like I do. And she, um, she also wrote nonlinear. Mm. So mm. it gave me hope that I could do that. The only linear part of the book is the, is the battle with the school to get him his basic civil rights. Right. And that right. had to be linear. Yeah, so. I mean, it, it, it more closely mirrors what it's like to be a parent or a child, I imagine, because yeah, things are happening in chronological order, but as always, your kids and your parents are both their age and their age 10 years ago right. and their 20 years before. So everything is always simultaneous. So in a way, yeah. the chronology... And that's what memory is like. Memory exactly. is dreamlike. You know, when I dream of Jesse, I dream of him at all different ages. So yeah. and that's what memory is. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I love this idea of you, you know, of writing as a way, writing memoir in particular as a way of continuing to spend time with, with the people, you know, in your life. And that's true of fiction 
as well to some extent because let's be honest most of us are writing when we write fiction we're either writing some thinly veiled version of ourselves or of people that we know <laughs> but it's true i just i ha i have a book of con uh, connected short stories and it's fiction but it's fiction but. right exactly. <laughs> now now your second memoir about your mother which you know um i you know as you know i've read that book twice once i one you know because I'm such a I'm such a mamone, I'm such a mama's boy, and I had to read <laughs> that book twice. Uh, I read it, uh, you know, I read it on, in paper first, and then I listened to it with my mother and my sister. I uh, love that. Car on a road trip, and I, it actually, and I've told you this, but I'll tell the audience too that it actually helped them to figure out a way to speak to each other better. You know, it really, it actually was a real, isn't it? We we listened to it right after my father died. And the two of them had, you know, had had challenges as you did with your mother, and yeah. um, and it really made them feel less alone, and it made them feel less isolated from each other and from themselves, which is what books do, which is what writing does, and what reading does so well, you know. So I just I'm saying all that also to thank you for, uh. you, know, you know, for that book, and also to ask whether that book too was a way of spending more time with. With your yes, mother. and, and I, I did think my mother was such a unique character that I really wanted to memorialize her yeah. because uh, she was an, she was amazing. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <God. laughs> it was very funny. I mean, I think she needs a sitcom all all yeah. devoted to her. But I mean, here she came here at eighteen. She's widowed at forty three with three kids. English is a second language. No means of of making money outside of her fabulous cooking right. which she used and then becomes a bookie for wise guys i mean she was amazing but when i was a kid i really wanted i wanted donna reed and not anna magnani you know what i mean so right. it was i want the culture was so i'm older than you are but uh, the culture, you know, the white Anglo-Saxon Protestant culture was bearing down on me with everything that I saw as far as on television and, you know, believe me, the nuns, n nobody with a vowel at the end of their name ever crowned the Blessed Virgin on May Day. <laughs> so, so it was, um, I felt um, isolated. I felt, uh, you know, and I'm sure people from other cultures feel this way all the time. And right. books were a way, that, I read books to learn about what it was like to be all American. Exactly. Yeah, to figure out how to navigate yes. that, this foreign land that we were in. Yes. I, I'm sure you felt yes. the same way. Like, I always felt like I was just an extension of my parents right. making our way in this right. new world. I didn't feel like this was my, like, my world, really. Like, I felt like a very, so much more aligned with my family unit and with right. Italy than I did with my school or my town or my country. Right. You know. But I was ashamed of the fact that my mother spoke with an accent and all of that. I, because oh, as I have written in, um, you know, now it's all about Tuscany and everything's, right. you know, Tuscan food and right. so artisanal and blah, blah. But then it was like you were embarrassed at the oil stains on your lunch bag that you brought to school. Yeah, it was mm. called meatball, but you know, I mean, like, it was horrible. Yeah, like, my brother was Tony Spumoni, the ice cream yeah, man in the school yeah. play, you know, so... <laughs> Did any of this, especially, and you know, um, and in particular, stuff about your mom end up in any of the comedy that you did before, or is it, or was the memoir the first time you really wrote about her? Um, I had written about her long before. Yeah, yeah, I had written about her many. I have, you know, journals and notes, and that's why it was so great because I had full yeah. conversations, and, right. and she never wrote me anything. Yeah. Um, but I have, I, I have all of her conversations, and uh, so that really helped. Yeah. You know, when I was. Yeah, I remember. I think I also told you this before, but one of the most sort of moving. There's so many moving parts in both of your books, um, but. Um, one of the, for me, one of the most moving parts was when you described how laborious it was for your mother to write her name. Um, yeah. and, and I remember seeing my mother struggle, you know, with that. And, and I never understood it because I was like, just write your name. What's the big deal? Yeah. But, but um, you were clueless, Chris. Yeah, I mean, yeah. 
And, and you know, you know what really opened the door for me was watching my brilliant friend, the Elena Ferrante. And if, mm -hmm. if any of you out there have not read her books, oh right. my God, my brilliant friend, HBO did. And the mother, the mother just killed me in that because she reminded me a lot of my mother. Yeah. Uh, she was very, you know, she was very bitter. And, and she, there's one point where she says to her daughter, you think you're better than me. But at mm -hmm. the same time, she's proud of her daughter. Yep. And it's, it's this That's it right there. Yeah. That, that those two can coexist at the same yeah. time that you're resentful and proud. And yeah. I think that's way so, you know, so many immigrants are, yes. and other immigrants are caught in those kinds of, those kinds of paradoxical binds, yes. you know, and it makes for, you know, really great writing and, and yes. art, you know, but it doesn't make for the uncomfortable childhoods and adolescence and all that sort of stuff. But, but you know, we, we came to our own, um, you know, we got together and, you know, it was having my own child. That's number one. First of all, that's when, you know, your mind opens to like, oh, this is what it's like. Right. So that really made a difference between, you know, the way we related to each other. Although even there, even there it was, you know, because she was always so worried for us, you know, so afraid for us. And yet she was so brave coming here by herself, you know. Uh, yeah, I know, it's amazing. They, my parents were the same way. Like they went through so much and, and they, I mean, this is a cliche in a way for me to say, but their whole thing was, we don't want you to go through what, right. we, what we went through. And so they treated us like we were these hothouse flowers, you know, like right. we couldn't, which isn't good <laughs> right no it's not good at all no. right? yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, every picture of me has me squirming out of my mother's arms like no i i uh, you know every picture of me has me wrapped around my mother's <laughs> leg so i mean this is just like, like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but i mean also as a you know as a i mean women and i mean it's not yes. just it's you, you were know, the boy my brother was the principe in my right. family right exactly yeah yeah. Do, did you feel like as an artist as well, like what, what sort of, what did you, what did you have to face as an artist, as a woman, as an Italian woman, as an immigrant oh. woman, and, you know, what are the, you know. Well, I always say resentfully to my husband, who is, you know, wasp man, I always say to him, you've played Italians, and I have not played <laughs> a lot, you know, so I, I got <laughs> ethnic, de I got a lot of your two ethnic when I was first starting to act. You know, you're too ethnic, you're too ethnic, you're too ethnic. And I, I re oh, I remember crying and saying, why am I even doing this? I'll never, you know. So, but, you know, when The Sopranos came along, I was really happy. I thought, okay, I'm never going to sell soap, but I'm on an incredibly well-written show, <laughs> you know. And you know what was weird with, with The Sopranos was they um, called me in to audition. I had not worked in 10 years. But at the same time, they were reading my scripts. So they were considering me as a writer. So it was like, I'm a writer, I'm an actor, I'm a writer, I'm an actor. Wow. It was really weird. Did you, you ever think, did you ever get a chance to write for that show or no? No, they had one woman. Oh. One woman. Well, that's enough, right? Isn't that what they uh, Because the, the whole theory was that women <laughs> couldn't read violence. Right. Women couldn't write violence. If only they could see inside my head. Right. Especially <laughs> now. But, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Wow. So. And um, gosh, I had a question and it went out. It went out of my head. Um, but um, um, well, okay, let me go to my questions. Because man, I had I had a good question right on that. And it totally it'll come back. back. It'll come back. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it was, I think it was about the. Oh, I was going to say. Oh, now I remember. So the you know it's so interesting because the stuff that we read. I think we both grew up. You said reading the Gothic, reading the you know all this stuff. I never read anything about Italians. Me uh, either. Nothing, you know. So Never we, either. Yeah, we grow up consuming all these kinds of, all these worlds and all these types of, of um, you know, of experiences, which is sort of the best thing about reading and growing up and having, and realizing and thinking, oh my God, like what a world there is out there. And yet when we ourselves as artists go to do our thing, we're expected to be in this box, right? We're That's the Italian, true. we're the we're, oh, with writing as well. Like I can only write if, if I'm if I'm writing from a different perspective, or I'm writing from, you know, something that's not like me. People are like, what are you doing? Why aren't you writing about Italian right. stuff? Right, right. Oh, that's so strange. It's <laughs> so. strange, but I mean, yeah, it's the same thing. Although I recently, the last thing I wrote was mm -hmm. a was a ten minute scene. Yes, because I want to ask you about Chris this. and yes. I, yes. my husband and I. Right. were invited to um, 
to be part of this thing called the isolation project where this producer that we who knew us um said look i'm i'm going to send you equipment will you film yourselves mm -hmm. and there are and then it went on to the next people doing it are Rebecca Hall, who was in the town with Chris, and uh, Morgan Spector, who did the plot against America. They're filming right now. And before us were Julianne Nicholson, who was in um, August Osage County, and her husband with a very a relay race where they like like not race, but like they're doing theirs. They send you the equipment, you right. make yours, and then you send it on. Right. Although we didn't send it, there was someone sheltering down on the Cape who worked okay. for this one, who was driving it to the, oh, the wow. next couple. But, wow. and because Chris is so fantastically organized, <laughs> he, um, he, he knew what to do. He, you know, he unloaded it very specifically. So we, but it, we still were insane. And I wrote wild turkeys into it like, in, like a <laughs> lunatic. So we spent a lot of times hanging out on our lawn waiting for turkeys to come. Um, so that answers <laughs> the question of what you've been doing I was going to ask you what you've been doing during the during the lockdown and the yes. pandemic. You've been yes. creating art, which is amazing. You know, you well, it took us a week to recover from that, and um, <laughs> and we even put our dog in our rescue was the custody dog oh um, in the scene. But I'm not. I'm finding it hard to to actually write during this pandemic. Yeah. Are you? I've had I've had a real struggle to yeah. write, yeah. Yeah. and um, and and there's a lot going on. There's consciousness being raised about the horrible endemic original sin of racism in this country, and I just feel sometimes I feel like I would just shut up and let them, you know, let other people uh, who need to speak do their thing. But you know, uh, I don't know. I'm in the middle of all these things. I'm in the middle of a. Uh, um, you know, I, my agent wants to sell this fiction that I've written. I'm halfway through a memoir about the rescue dogs and grief. Wow. Wow. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's hard because I, you, you probably, you were saying you probably feel some, maybe some pressure or some obligation to write about the current moment. But yeah. in a way, I feel like if we don't have the, if we don't have anything to say really that we're urgently, that, that, that is instinctively urgent for us to say, I think it's okay to sit back and let other people who right. have something urgent to say, say it. And then in the meantime, the projects right. that you are working on that are urgent to you, like the fiction, the memoir, that's going to be just as valid and, and, right. and you know, uh, exciting whenever it's ready, you know? Right. So we, I'm saying this to you to remind myself as well, yes. that we should all be working on the projects that feel urgent to us, whether or not they're directly tied to what's going on right now. Right. You know? It's just I'm, such a chaotic time. It's hard not to be really, really distracted absolutely. right now. Yeah. But yeah, yeah I, I decided to keep a plague diary too, oh, you know, good. like Samuel Pepys. Right. <laughs> Good, good. And you know, when are we going to be able to see the movie that you made? Or? I do not know. They're still filming it, you know, the, okay. uh, the couples. Right. <laughs> <laughs> idea. Yeah. yeah. No idea. It was it was really fun. It was really hard. I mean, we we both acted, so we know Chris and I knew how much goes into it. You know, script supervisors, were right. you holding this glass during that last shot? Or we had one horrific night where I was in charge of the sound, and I said, "The sound is off," and we didn't know how long it had been off. Like, was it <laughs> was it off the entire night? Did you also have the lens cap on? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So that was terrifying. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. yeah, I think we're all in this sort of uncharted, uncharted yeah. territory, you know? I wish somebody would give me, like, a project that I had to do. <laughs> send me the... Exactly. <laughs> well, that's what was great about it. It was like, yeah. you, you need to get this done. You need yeah. to film this in three days. You need to have the script ready. Wow. So that was... I love deadlines myself. Yeah, deadlines absolutely. are great. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so, um, you know, another, another aspect of your life that I wanted to talk about that I, you know, that I alluded to earlier was your you know, is your activism um, and, you know, the way that you have been speaking out for, you know, for disability rights and all that yes. you've done for that. And I'd love for you to speak a little bit about that and also speak about, I know you and, you know, you and Chris, Chris Cooper, in case anyone doesn't know, um, I'm sure are asked to do all kinds of things for, you know, for various charities. And so I'm curious about, the, again, the, you know, the um, <clears throat> first, the disability work you've done and then what specifically about, you know, this organization, Raising a Reader, that speaks to you, you know, uh, you know, in particular. We've already obviously touched a little bit on that, but I would love to hear you say a little bit more about it. 
Well, we, Chris and I both um, executive produced um, an, um, a documentary yes. called yes. Intelligent yes. Lives yes. that came out a couple of years ago. And it was our, our good okay. friend, Dan Habib, who has a son, like our son, Jesse, a uh, quadriplegic, nonverbal, cognitively intact son. And he, he wanted to do um, a documentary about how testing marginalizes people with disabilities and immigrants. Mm. And it's true. I mean, if you see this documentary, which by the way, is going to be screening, um, uh, if you just go to intelligentlives.org, mm -hmm. you, you can see all the places it'll be screening. And uh, Chris did the narration for it too. I've and, it um, I watched and, it, it was wonderful. Yeah. And um, it, Part of it is, uh, well, you know, we didn't even know how much of Jesse would have been in it. So we, we went to the premiere at Ashland and we, we had never seen the entire, we had only seen the rough footage and we didn't know how much of our son was in it. And we watched it and it's dedicated to Jesse and the lights came up and we were just puddles, the two of yeah. us and we had to go up on stage and they're like, oh okay, everybody, come on. Oh, oh, but, oh my God. But yeah. it was, um, it came out of the struggle because testing, when we were fighting the school to get Jesse his basic civil rights, they insisted on having him tested with no adaptation for his disability. Mm -hmm. So it's like me asking you to read War and Peace in Aramaic or something. I'm assuming you don't read Aramaic. Um, and uh, it was, it was enraging to see what they were doing. And as Chris said, they would say things like, Jesse, do you dust a dresser? You know, and Chris was like, you know, it just wasn't a chore I had thought to assign my right. quadriplegic son. So it was just, and, and ugh, it was a waste of taxpayer money to do yeah. that. It was ridiculous, yeah. you know, so. Yeah. yeah. And so. I mean, he was, and Jesse, I think also, you know, I think people hear, oh, you had a quadriplegic nonverbal son. Therefore, you know, he had no relationship to, to words. But of course, yeah. he was. Oh my he God, was he was a wonderful poet, and exactly. he he wrote his first poem at age ten, wow. and he he learned to read. Uh, I he I knew he could read long before mm -hmm. anybody else believed that he could read. Um, but he also BC Boston College had this um, uh, program where they had something called the eye gaze computer, and mm -hmm. Jesse they put electrodes around his eye, and he proved he could read which wow. I had already known, but yeah. he was reading, it was such a dramatic moment because he was reading this book, um, Just Grandma and Me. Um, and it said, we wanted to fly the kite, but the wind was too strong. And his eye would light up every word as it wow. you know, landed wow. on it. And I said, what, what word up there describes you? Strong, strong. Wow. Oh um, my God. Amazing. It was so moving. And then he played um, a video game with, with Chris, with his dad, and he beat Chris. So he just <laughs> giggled the whole way home. But That's now nice. that, that uh, electrode thing is now a pro it was a prototype then. It's now in use. Oh, wow. So that's fantastic. But that's Jesse didn't need that because he had volitional movement. He could pull a switch. So when we finally got him into school and we got rid of the SPED director, mm -hmm. um, never mess with an Italian mother. I will kill you. <laughs> grizzly bear, right? Is that how you describe yourself? The grizzly bear? <laughs> I, I totally was like, uh, I... I was like, this guy is not going to have a job when I'm done with him. Right. And I organized all the parents mm -hmm. and um, we got a parent with a child with a disability on the school board mm -hmm. and we used um, the newspapers, we used media and we made sure this guy's, um, because this guy right. was quoted as saying, why should we spend money on these kids? They don't give anything back to society. Oh my God. Oh my it God. was. Yeah, that's infuriating. It was so enraging. I lived in a perpetual, I'm a rageaholic anyway, but I lived in a perpetual state of rage. I literally had to get a punching bag during that wow. thing. It was, wow. it was so enraging. But wow. Jesse loved books. He mm -hmm. loved to read and he loved words more than anything. And watching him write a poem was one of the most moving things you could see because he had to laboriously pick right. these words. And then he was very insistent on where the words were wow. in the poem. Wow. And uh, one of the poems he wrote called Always Sometimes mm -hmm. had I am sometimes invisible, which is what happens to people with disabilities. They're invisible now. People with disabilities are dying of COVID at a much higher rate than anybody else. But do you hear of this? No, you do not. Right. Um, but at any rate, mm -hmm. he um, insisted that I am sometimes invisible be front and center, right in the middle of the poem. You oh, know, where wow. it, so yeah, he, yeah. he even thought like a poem. 
a poet. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And so. you know, I think of how many kids are written off for various yeah. reasons, whether yeah. they have a disability, and how the 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 the, um, the act of putting a book in the hand of a kid, you just don't know which of those kids is going to have that kind of spark, that kind of connection, that kind of ability to see himself or herself or themselves as a um, a writer, an artist, or however they want to change the world, right? And yes. so, um, but of course, we turned Chris, uh, Jesse onto Christy Brown really early, and Christy <laughs> Nolan, these writers with quadriplegia who okay. wrote. You know what I mean? It's okay. it's not impossible. Of course, but yeah. but we had resources. We were we were lucky, you know, and that's why we have. I tell people who have children with disabilities, mm -hmm. uh, the Federation for Children with Special Needs here in Boston is wonderful. It's a parent-to-parent -parent organization. Mm -hmm. And there's a Jesse Advocacy Fund there if you're fighting for inclusion <laughs> for your child. Amazing. Thank you so much. I see, that, I see that our host is back too. Uh, yeah. I, yeah, the, <laughs> I have to tell you, like, I had to be prodded to come back because I was like, no, I just want to let them keep talking. <laughs> like, I don't want to go back because then they're going to stop. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we, you know, I think I'll just speak for myself and say thank you. Um, but I think on behalf of all of us who are here, like, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Uh, your words together are pretty impactful. And so we're very grateful. Um, I do have to, I mean, this conversation seems so ripped from the headlines in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, you know, Marianne, you just said that you were enraged. And it seems like right now there are a lot of people who are enraged for very appropriate reasons. Yes, yes rage and I'm is, glad. Rage is a motivator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a motivator, you know. A mo right. And not... Exactly. Yeah, a motivator and an appropriate response yeah. to certain yeah. situations. And I guess as you talk about Jesse and you talk about him being a writer and a reader, I mean, I, I have to imagine that that wasn't, that didn't happen by osmosis. That no. you were, that, that there was a very concerted effort to there's help. A quote from, there's a quote from that book. I said to my husband, screw the itsy bitsy spider, we're giving him Yates. And we did. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. So, would you, could you paint a picture for us? Um, like, what did it look, so I'll, I have to tell you that I had a quadriplegic, profoundly deaf uh, member of my family, my uncle, who lived a long time and recently passed away, was a big part of my growing up, was helping to take care of him. Um, and he also similarly, you know, like loved words, even though he couldn't speak. Yeah. Um, and so I have a picture for myself in our family, what that looked like, but would you tell us like, what did it look like when Jesse was five, six, seven, and you were doing the things that you do with five, six, seven year olds and books I'm, or, or four, five, whatever. Um, well, I mean, we, we, that reading was a big part of the every day, every single day, Jesse, he loved books and we actually, I, I went above because I read above my pay grade when I was a kid. So I let him run, read above his pay grade. He was still in, you know, he was a freshman in high school. We were reading James Joyce. We were reading um, Portrait of the Artist. Mm -hmm. You know, I just thought, well, you know what? The beauty of the words, it washes over you. Even if you don't know the exact meaning of every single word, mm -hmm. it's good it's going to you will it's like osmosis it's a uh, you know right. and but we, you must you yeah. must have read to him because he just physically couldn't turn pages right exactly exactly yes i so read that, to him. you would just sit there and read together i'm assuming I that's mean, right that's right that is what we did every single day although you know now i think there are programs i see i have friends with a kid like jess and what I see that they have now, I mean, it was Jurassic when we were doing it. You know, it was the beginning of this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And now, like I said, what used to be electrodes is now no longer a prototype. Mm -hmm. So, right. yeah, moved and then, on. And then we have like books on tape, like you were saying, Christopher. Yes, we did books on tape a lot with Jess too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and the marriage of those things, right? With yep. technology and the ability to turn on your own yes. books on tape. And, yes. I yeah. mean, that's okay. Well, um, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, being, I'm getting more direct messages offline <laughs> telling me, okay, Ian, it's time. Um, so don't go away because 
uh, I wanna invite back um, our uh, executive director. So Christine, will, will you come? I know she's right here with us, but uh, there's Christine. <laughs> <laughs> I too felt like I was in a little like, you know, cafe with you listening to your wonderful story and Edwin well, Trump. Thank you so much for sharing, so wonderful. Um, you have such a special connection between each other as well, which is, you know, really comes out when you talk like this. But I just, um, I don't know if you realize what uh, a wonderful example you were of our program by talking about so many different ways that writing and reading has affected you and your family and how you were brought up and your culture, um, you know, and the, the challenges with, with the school and you know, you're advocating for your child to go to school and learn. I mean, it's just wonderful. I really appreciate it. And then you also talked about the resources. And so I think I will kind of tie a nice little bow because um, you've done such a wonderful job sharing your connection uh, and, and how it ties to our mission of ending the literacy opportunity gap. So thank you so much. But we need your help to get these wonderful resources to these families who would love to have books. So um, I know Ian will do a wonderful pitch as well. So I'll leave it to him. But honestly, thank you so much for your time. You were wonderful. Well, thanks, Christine. Thank you. And, and, and I mean, it's the perfect setup, Christine. I mean, it's my pleasure to get to remind everyone who's here with us that, you know, having the opportunity to read with your kids when they're little is a lifelong game changer and can be so challenging for so many people who would love to do it. Right. And raising a reader is meeting families right at that critical place and saying, you have the desire and the drive. All you're lacking are the relatively easy tools of books. Yeah. And, and yes, it is a, I mean, boy, this is, a, it feels like it's a right. It should be a right to have access yeah. to literature that is age appropriate, culturally relevant, because that's how you connect with the rest of the world. Otherwise, we're just saying, you know what? It's just like I'm sure people said to Jesse, Marianne, like, you know, like that teacher, that, you know, terrible, you know, yeah. you don't contribute anything. You right. just get to be isolated. Right. You don't, that's it. Well, right. sure. And we know what's happening right now in the world. And I'm, you know, is that when you isolate people, then they can't contribute. And then it's a terrible spiral. So we're not doing that. At Raising Career <laughs> Massachusetts, we're breaking that cycle and we're giving books to young kids and families and only with your help. So please send us all your money and we will put it to good use. <laughs> that's all we can say about that. Um, before you both, uh, before I offer you the Ask chance to you. And can I answer these questions? Do, do. Oh, um, uh, no, what I'm supposed to tell you is that we will send you the question. Oh, okay, cool. And if you wouldn't mind writing a couple no. of responses, we'll send them to everyone because, you know, we're, we're over time, which is great. <laughs> uh, okay. I, uh, we are gathering again next week on Tuesday. Uh, and Susan Solomon will be with us at Live with an Author. So I want to make sure everybody um, come back and join us next Tuesday. There she is, Susan Solomon. Um, and um, also, I want to remind people about our Dinner with an Author, which is our annual gala on the 15th of October. Uh, and I, I, I have it on good authority that these two amazing authors are planning to attend this live virtual event. Absolutely. Chris, Christopher is already um, pre-funking, which is a, a very long time to do that, but great. Uh, and um, so, and oh, and there's a wonderful photo. Um, so please, please plan to join us on October 15th at um, Dinner with an Author and Marianne Leone and Christopher Castellani will be there as well. Uh, thank you again to PNC Bank for being our amazing lead sponsor on Live with an Author. Um, we couldn't do it without you. And I believe I've covered all of the important things other than I just want to say, Marianne Leone, uh, you know, the chance to get to like be here with you in this space is, you know, I'm just trying to stay cool, but it is like, I'm, it's, I'm working hard to be cool with you because I'm a big fan. So uh -huh. thank you so much um, for being here. It's really, uh, it's, it's been an honor. So thanks. thanks. Totally fun. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, that's yes. uh, now everyone. Goodbye. You can wave there. I'm going to let them wave goodbye and thank, thank you both. You. Take care.